So um, for my background, I've spent a lot of years working in dung beetles in here and in, in Africa. And um, I think I first realised the potential of dung beetles in New Zealand back in 1992 uh, when I was a, um, a technician working for, back then it was the end of the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research. Um, it's, a long, it's a long time, yeah, it's a long time ago. And, um, and I did my masters on, on the, the dung beetles that we already do have here in New Zealand, um, of which we have a few. Um, and, it, and I guess it was at that point in seeing how, not so much useless they are, but how poor they were at contributing to actual wholesale reduction of the manure that we have on our paddocks. And um, I thought upon it myself that we, we kind of need to get something going here for New Zealand and basically a recycling process of, of what animals produce, which is manure and lots of it. Um, and bury it naturally through a standard cycle which exists in the countries where the beetles plus the livestock originated from. And as soon as you bring livestock, and well, that includes horses, of course, and, uh, and, and cows and alpacas and everything else, into a country which doesn't have its own consignment of beetles or beetles that accompany these sorts of things, then you get a, a major problem, which most of you are probably aware in, in the media, um, all attributes to intensified farming or things from that going into water quality issues, etc., etc. And it's all because there's nothing actually getting rid of the manure that's sitting on the pasture surfaces. Now, if we had beetles here, like Andrew points to, 150, 170 years ago when we brought the first livestock in, largely from Australia, then we probably wouldn't be having to play a massive catch-up game like we are now. So the whole process is trying to, trying to um, complete a broken circle in the recycling process of manure that's generated from animals. Um, so dung beetles, well, you've probably seen lots of this on TV anyway, and, and you see a lot of natural history documentaries about the big ball rollers and all those bits and pieces, but because of their, um, their behavior and, and the ecological potential from the services provided by these beetles, we know an awful lot about them. So they're amongst the most heavily studied uh, group of insects in the world. Part of it is because there is um, a lot of sexual cooperation between the boys and the girls. It's amongst the highest in all the insect groups where the boy does a lot of work one, in, in seducing the female, and two, in protecting her and also preparing the nest for her as well. So he does a lot of work. Um, it's quite remarkable in the insect world. <laughs> in the insect world. <laughs> so, um, and of course, um, because of the services they provide, um, they're being used quite a lot around the world and now here in New Zealand in the biological control um, of manure. And in this context, um, these animals have evolved with the sorts of animals, and they are ruminants and non-ruminants that provide lots of manure. If we go back 100 and, uh, about 49 million years ago, I think there was a radiation of all of the, of, the, of the artiodactyles, and at the same time, the flowering plants, and at the same time, there was a huge radiation in all the different types of dung beetles that followed the diversification of mammals, uh, and their ruminants and non-ruminants. So there's a lot of beetles out there, and there are a lot of naturally occurring dung beetles with these animals on every continent of the world except Antarctica. What, what do they do? Well, um, I probably should have pointed out there, there are three different types of dung beetles. They're the rollers, they're the ones you see David Attenborough banging on about on TV, because those are the showy guys. Um, and then you've got these ones that are dwellers. We have several of those in New Zealand. They just live within the manure pile. We have lots of those in this country already accidentally here. And then the ones that we're most uh, interested in are those ones that actually remove the dung from the pasture surface to beneath the soil, into the soil horizon, down to about 90 centimetres in, uh, in some places. Um, and so while you don't see those beetles very much because they're not so glamorous for the cameras, they're doing most of the work uh, beneath the soil surface directly under the pile of manure. Um, what are they doing in each of those balls? Well. It's a, it's a standard cycle, uh, like you see at school with the butterflies, etc., etc. They've got an, an egg phase. So when they bury the manure beneath the, um, the soil, each little ball or sausage has an egg deposited in it by the female. And it goes through a larva stage. And the larva goes through three different stages, getting bigger and bigger each time. It turns into a, a cocoon with a, a pupa or a chrysalis. And then that emerges out to a brand new adult and the cycle continues. It's pretty standard, straightforward insect life cycle. And that uh, lasts, as I say, from six weeks to six months, depending on the size and how long the adult will live for. 
well, they're pretty good. So they're, they're driven by reproduction, basically, and they'll bury in whatever the manure is that they're on. They, we, we tend to think they have preferences for certain soil types, and we certainly highlight those for some beetles that like clay loam soils or compacted clay soils, etc., etc. So they do tend to have preferences, but at the end of the day, they'll bury in whatever they're on. Um, that said, the rollers, you'll see some beetles in the back. There's a whole bunch of rollers there. They're, morphologically, their body shape's design is not robust and it's more fragile for burying in sands. They can't bury in compact clays. So you find the big tunnelling beetles that we've got coming to New Zealand, they're more strong and robust, capable of burying into those thicker, thicker soils. So they'll bury in basically anything. Um, so by far the most abundant out of the, there's about 8,000 different types of dung beetles in the world. There are, from what we know, 4,500 different mammals all around the world, but there are 8,000 different kinds of dung beetles. Most of those are uh, tunnelers, um, the ones that go straight underneath the carpet. And of course they are by far the most abundant that you expect to see too. Um, we, we do have beetles in New Zealand. We have 15 different kinds. I've been revising that group um, for a while now. Um, we have 15. It's quite extraordinary because we have such quite a big country, a diverse country, yet the dung beetle fauna itself is so limited for what we have. And it may well be because we are a country which was absent of mammals and it was only birds, for example. So the diversity of dung beetles was always quite limited. So we have them, but they're all living in native forests. They're all tiny, they all look like this, this is a millimeter. So most of them are very small, they're all ball rollers, they're all flightless, they all live on the forest floor and they all live at night time. So you'll never really see any of these transitioning from a native forest habitat into a, a pasture or modified habitat such as grasslands. So when one of the questions comes when we look to importing these beetles, when they ask what impacts will there be on the native dung beetle fauna, well, the impact is deemed to be negligible to non-existent because the habitat specificity for native beetles and our open grassland beetles is such that there's no transition, or to minimal to no transition, when they cross over into different habitats. Those ones I said live inside the dung piles. We've got a bunch of them here already. This is just a few examples, but they're all small. They've all come in from Europe or Australia by accident. They do very little in terms of getting rid of our manure. These ones here are the true dung-bearing beetles that have been here for quite some time. The middle one is the Mexican dung beetle which came in deliberately in the 60s. Uh, we brought it in from Samoa. These two on the outside uh, come from um, South Australia. They came over with the first stock in the 1870s and they're distributed all around the North Island and a little bit of the South Island. But these are so small and their abundance so limited, their impact on helping us remove all of that surface manure is exceedingly limited. So they kind of need help from bigger, more efficient dung bearing beetles. Uh, so what is the problem? Well, for you guys, it, it's all about dealing with mountains of shit. And, and we all know that horses produce an awful lot because they are non-ruminants uh, and non-ruminants are very inefficient in the digestive process. They poo an awful lot. And for you guys, that means a lot of shoveling and a lot of vacuuming and a lot of everything else. So it's, it's, it's a key problem for the horsing industry. It's also a key problem uh, with, of course, livestock that we intensively farm. Um, and if we're, if we're talking specifically about horses, well, what, what do you tend to do with all this dung? You are all very familiar with this whole practice. It's what we have to do to clean up our pastures. It's something I know virtually all of you don't subscribe to liking at all. So um, we either sell it or package it up or, or just manually compost it and move it, but it's a, it's a labour-intensive task, which is what we currently have to do. Um, if we go on about what that whole process actually means and why you get rid of it off the pasture, it's because um, there's quite an obvious avoidance of, of manure by horses, as there is any other livestock in the paddocks. And if you drive anywhere in the country on a paddock that's being vacated off its livestock and left to recover, you'll see these huge swords um, coming up all over the paddock. Each one of those has a pile of poo left in it. Um, and so an area five times the size of that is, is left avoided because that's uh, basically a zone of repugnance. No animal actually wants to eat around its own or someone else's excrement. So it's avoided. 
uh, and so you get huge pastoral wastage. A couple of calculations about that. We've got, what, nine million, nine and a half million beef and dairy cows in production a year in New Zealand. Each cow, on average, produces about 11 poos and times that by 9.5 million every day. Currently, at the moment, um, the manure sits on the pasture surface for, what, four, four weeks to six months, depending on the time of year, accumulating every day. So you times that value daily for, let's say, conservatively for a month. And times that by five for the area around each cow pat that's left. It's an awful lot of paddock left unutilised um, because of forage fouling and the avoidance of the manure. We know they avoid it because something's co-evolved with it and it's a type of fungus which lives in manure uh, and it's evolved with grazing mammals um, and it's produced these projectile reproductive bodies that shoot out two, two metres past that zone of repugnance to make sure that its reproductive parts are again taken up in the feeding process of grazing animals, so completing its life cycle. If it didn't do this, it wouldn't exist. So it's had to do that because of avoidance of the, of the um, grass around where the poo is, where the animals just want to avoid. So we know they avoid manure. So they shoot it two metres away. Um, oh, that's, that's basically what it looks like on horse manure. So if you're out in, on, a, on a humid day and you look after, at some horse manure, you'll see these little shiny white things and they shoot these little um, reproductive spores out. So we overcome it. There's many, many reasons for brake feeding, but one of them is to get the animals in to utilise that pasture, which would otherwise be avoided by, um, um, you know, by stock, which would avoid it. But if you squeeze them all together and you corner off a paddock, you're forcing them into that environment where they've got to feed on that grass, which is not the greatest for the well-being of the animal itself. Um, just some key things about this whole process is for, for what beetles do and, and, uh, and what, their, what, what the actual problem is, I should I say, is, is surface runoff. And New Zealand's got a big problem with water quality here, and a lot of it's attributed to what's coming off the pasture surfaces. Um, and a lot of that's um, dependent on how good the quality is of the soil. If it's compacted and ruined soil, things go across the surface rather than into it. And then, of course, we've got degradation in water quality. It's one of the biggest problems is um, there's a nitrogen and phosphorus and, of course, all of the disease, pathogens, etc., entering our waterways, making it unsafe to swim in or unsafe to utilise for drinking. Um, and, of course, degradation of soils. That's one of the key things. Soils need air spaces, um, macropores. The grass roots require those air spaces as well to be able to function properly. And, of course, the microorganisms also require those air spaces. If you squash those through compaction and abuse of the soils, most of those microorganisms and grasses can't function to the optimal. And, of course, as Franklin Roosevelt says, a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. So uh, what do we do with all this dung? Uh, well, there's a re mechanical removal process. Um, you may have seen all these. Some of you may even utilise one or two of these kind of contraptions. They do have benefits, of course. It removes all manure with each use. Um, it eliminates the forage foul because you're just physically getting rid of the manure. I mean, of course, many of you are probably just shoveling manually each day to get rid of the manure, but there are machines that do this. Um, and of course, it reduces the requirement on drenches. Um, no manure means no reinfection pathways on, on certain types of parasites. Um, the non-benefits, of course, is that, well, you're actually getting rid of the manure off the paddock, but you've still got to do something with the manure. You've got to put it somewhere. So it may be in a machine or in your wheelbarrow, but it's got to go somewhere from there. And of course, machineries like this, they exacerbate the compaction and destroying of the soil structure. So the air pores are all gone. And of course, there's daily management costs and time. So if you're just wheelbarrowing, it's still time in terms of your time shoveling or time and money to operate these sorts of machineries every day to do that job. The alternative, of course, is, is dung beetles. At the same sort of price range as those mechanical pieces of equipment, you could be benefiting from uh, dung beetles, for example. And there are some key benefits to this over and above mechanical removal of, of manure. And the, the key one I've put in red is it's improving that soil health and that water quality. 
I'll show you some of the benefits in a second, but it's quite phenomenal just what they do simply by burying and tunneling beneath those horse piles. Of course, they minimalize forage fowl as well. I can't say eliminates it, but it will minimize it because not all dung is completely removed. Most of it will be. And of course, it's reducing your dependency on drenches, of course. And of course, the, the, the key thing difference here with these beetles is that once you've put them in your paddock and they've established, they are self-sustaining and there's little management that you need to do once they're in your paddock. The non-benefits, which is probably more of a risk more than non-benefit, is again, some of these drenches, and we've had a quick discussion, which we'll probably elaborate on a little bit, is that maybe many of the drenches that we are utilizing for the horse industry aren't actually detrimental to dung burying fauna, including earthworms. So it may not be such a problem. But one of the risks, of course, with some of those drenches is that they can retard or eliminate success in establishing your beetles because some of those compounds are residual in the manure post the treatment of the animal and it has deleterious effects on the, on the survivorship of the things feeding on the manure. That can stop establishment of your beetles. Yeah. What about fertilizers? Fertilizers have zero effect or impact on dung beetles themselves because dung beetles are basically freeloaders on the paddock. They, they don't care much about soil pH or anything really. They just utilize it for making nests. And so yeah, those things. And herbicides have no impact either. Um, the other one is a lag in time. So with any biological agent, it doesn't just happen instantaneously. You will get a, a colony of beetles, but those colony of beetles need to multiply. You sort of life cycle. One female may produce anything from 15 to maybe 50 eggs in her lifetime. And if it's six to nine weeks, the numbers will quickly grow at an exponential rate. So you, eventually you get a good carrying capacity of beetles proportional to the amount of manure on your paddocks. Once that's there, that's self-sustained at that level. Um, but there is a lag in time to get to that point. So when you put them out, you're not just going to suddenly see them instantaneously. They sort of dilute into the environment, get on with their thing in the background, and eventually the carrying capacity gets to a point where you can start recovering it and seeing it. But that's like any biological control organism. It takes time to build the numbers up. Um, some of those benefits... Uh, from just the services provided by dung beetles are quite phenomenal. We know all of this stuff because it's so heavily studied in literature overseas and also what we're currently doing in New Zealand. But soil structure and function, we know tunneling improves, um, increases level plant nutrients in the subsoil, similar to those levels of, of adding solid fertilizer inputs because manure is full of nitrates and phosphates and potassium and all those good bits. If you can bury it, then why add solid fertilizer inputs, which are quite expensive, because it's all sitting in your dung. Um, we've found some, um, well, we've done some studies overseas on the very similar um, pastures as we have here in New Zealand, and we're currently conducting the same experiments here now, is that beneath each animal manure pile, we are finding increased levels in phosphates and nitrates and all the other chemicals up to about two to three years post any dung beetle activity. So that level is increased beneath the soil uh, for a quite a long period of time post dung beetle activity. Eventually, especially in intensive pastoral systems where it's probably a little bit more applicable, but through random repeated depositions of manure on paddocks at any given time over three or four or five or six rotations on the paddock, you're eventually going to get a fairly big coverage of manure on a paddock. And with that, all of it buried by the beetles, you're just going to get all of that nutrient stuff underground and elevated levels for quite some period of time. So it'll virtually do away with your requirement for solid fertilizer inputs. So yeah, um, the manure is actually really beneficial because it's full of good stuff. Um, of course, we want to increase the air spaces in the soil as well. So we want to improve soil structure. So those tunnels in increase airways, it reduces the compaction, it brings those deep down soils up to the surface. And of course it increases the amount of organic matter that we're putting into the soil. So all of that organic carbon, for example, is going underneath the ground, it's being utilized by all the microbes, also by the plants. Improved soil structure means greater penetration of the grass roots and improved root biomass as well. And of course some of the studies that we've found as well is that Pastoral earthworms benefit quite enormously as well. Following dung beetle activity, we find a five-fold increase in the, not only the biomass, but also the size of the earthworms 
post dung beetle activity because all that dung is actually in the ground. I should add is that when they bury manure, this, this pot here is full of old cast off um, balls off, off dung. And while we show that the dung beetles are utilizing all this manure from the surface, they're not very efficient in terms of how much they utilize for their babies in each ball. So they leave probably, um, well, carries. In the, there's a lady here, Carrie Yoshida, she's um, my production manager for dung beetle innovation. She'll know all about this kind of stuff. But um, we'd say, what, at least half of the ball is left behind after a, about a third? Yeah, so about a third is used and about two thirds is left behind by the dung beetle once the, the new adults come up. So that's a lot of manure left in the ground after the dung beetle's been and done with it, which is being um, utilised by the earthworms and the microorganisms and the grass roots. And that's a lot of organic carbon captured beneath the pasture surface. Um, so we know it has great benefits to earthworms. Um, water issues, well, we're also looking at this, but um, that's one of the key ones for a lot of this dung beetle work in New Zealand. Um, and again, particularly at um, livestock that's intensively farmed. Um, but of course, the knock-on effect for improving soil structure is that we can get greater uh, infiltration into the soil horizon by things like um, urea from, from horses and cows peeing. And of course, all of those manures going in rather than across the surface. So uh, that reduces contaminants entering waterways. And this, of course, improves our water quality. So we've got a water accord in this country with a mandate to try and improve the level of water quality that we have in New Zealand, which is currently very low. So we want to try and improve the water quality. And one of the best ways is simply removing the surface manure, which is not going through and on the, into the waterways. Um, we know that we can do an, a substantial contribution to um, getting rid of the manure, therefore we have more pasture surface available for grazing. We know dung plus beetles has significant increases in plant quality, the height, the biomass, basically everything about the nutrient levels off the plants because manure is full of nutrients. And of course the biomass and the growing depth is significantly increased. You can get roots deeper down, that's also got an improved drought tolerance as well. So if you've got deeper roots, more tolerant to dry periods. They are attracted to brand new fresh manure. So if it's old and no longer smelly, they're not going to come to it. Let's say they do come to it and you have a good abundant supply of dung beetles, then a good majority of that should be disappearing underneath the ground. So we have beetles that are big beetles. We have small beetles. The big beetles remove a large volume of manure because they have to for the size of the ball they produce. So in some circumstances, we would expect to see, what, 80% or more of that manure buried within 24 to 48 hours after it's been put down by, um, voided by the animal. So um, that's when, though, you're at a point where you've got an abundant supply of dung beetles. So you would not expect to see that in the first couple of few years of releasing the beetles. The numbers have to build up to get to that kind of benefit where we see that's these things. That's what you'd aim for at that sustained level, yeah. Um, this isn't really big in New Zealand, but it was overseas. The key reason why they brought dung beetles into Australia, because uh, they had the same problem as us in terms of no native beetles really transitioning to the exotic cows that were brought into the country. But there's vast numbers of, um, oh, so that's, I'm jumping ahead of myself. This one here is applicable to us, sorry. This is um, the key one about gut parasites and nematodes. It's, it's a huge issue. It's something like a, well, you might probably know otherwise, but, um, I think it's something order of a $700 million industry in New Zealand with resistance management and all the other bits and pieces. It's quite a, a big industry. But we know we can get um, up to about 76% reduction in the reinfection rates of gut parasites following dung beetle activity, which is quite significant. There's a lot of literature that backs that up, including us. So we've even done that in this country and find the same level of, of knockback in the number of gut parasites which would help us greatly for those of us that rely quite heavily on drenches, particularly for gut parasites. Um, dung beetles will help reduce that, that chokehold that, that we currently have on us for the drench use. Um, the one I was elaborating on before is about the face and horn flies that some countries have, which are a real burden on stock over in places like Australia or other tropical countries. 
but they brought in dung beetles to control dung breeding flies. If the fly breeds in manure and you introduce a dung beetle, the dung beetle can bury that manure much faster than the fly can breed in it, thus knocking on the head on the entire population of the, the pest flies. So we found 95% loss of dung breeding flies in Hawaii and about 80 to 88 to 90% in, in Australia, excuse me, um, by burying the manure very quickly. Uh, I don't, we, from what I understand, we don't see, do we see flies as a, a nuisance problem in, in the uh, agricultural world? Do you know? Do we find it as a, a nuisance? Is it a, a fly strike for sheep? So we do have issues with them, but none of them are really breeding in manure though, are they? Uh, yes, yeah, stomoxis, isn't it? That that does that? Yeah, we're, yeah. So we. I don't think so, but I don't actually know the life cycle of those. Yes, I'm not sure if we have any flies in this country that are truly of nuisance value, like they have overseas that are biting and big problems that lose weight loss on livestock, etc. In Australia, I think here we don't classify flies as a key nuisance. Of course, we do have house flies, and house fly disease transmission pathways from manure to animals to our kitchen surfaces um, and you may know as well in the Camphala bacteriosis um, they kind of point the finger at house flies being one of the key vectors for this problem with humans and it's way higher in New Zealand than any other countries in the OECD um, but they're visiting manure um, yeah so carbon I just alluded to that before um, it's organic carbon that we can get rid of on a great rate um, it basically sits on the surface of the, uh, of the past surface and it's doing nothing on the surface. But um, if we can get rid of it from the surface, we can increase it uh, by burying it, sequestering it underground. Um, and of course that increases plant root production through improvement of soil, physical biochemical properties. Um, yeah, so this is one of the key take-home points. By rapidly manipulating fresh dung, dung beetles will aerate wet dung pads, thereby reduce anaerobic conditions needed for methane production. So these, these bacteria that are uh, anaerobic, so they don't like any oxygen, and they produce methane as a byproduct off, off that environment. But as soon as you put air into a, a manure pile and put a lot of air into the manure pile, these bacteria can't survive and it knocks the whole methane production on the head. So we know we can effectively control methane at least from the, the voided poos from horses and cows and sheep by using dung beetles. I think you'll find the agricultural researchers are focusing more on changing the, the I'm probably right in saying, I guess the, the gut or the types of feed or the gut environment inside the, the livestock rather than worrying about what comes out the other end. Um, I'll just bang through this because I don't want to labour on too much, but we, uh, like as Andrew mentioned, we were founded uh, not so long ago stems from uh, an end user group which uh, was responsible for applying to the government for permission to release, uh, import and release 11 different kinds of dung beetle into New Zealand. At the end of that whole process we continued um, uh, a commercial identity as dung beetle innovations. So these are the 11 different kinds of beetles that we have permission to bring to New Zealand. We have several of them here already and I'll show you those. How we do it? Well we have a couple of facilities out in the South Kaipara um, where we have an arrangement of, of different types of growing methods which all involve large volumes of soil upon which we put fresh, uh, largely organic manure free of chemicals so we know that beetles aren't going to be affected. Uh, and we um, put them through that basic cycle en masse and we collect the, the, um, the beetles as the new ones emerge out of the soil. So we do that in a different set of containers and locations. We utilise um, uh, soil en masse to fill up such large carrying capacity containers. So we have a very big operation out in um, Kuiper and as I say, Kauri behind you there is the one running all of that. Um, we also do a lot of research. So part of our mandate involves researching what we preach. We like to practice as well. So there's a lot of literature out there, but most of it is from overseas. Now, if we can show in New Zealand context the same sorts of results, then we can have confidence that what's being told overseas is applicable to New Zealand conditions too. And so far, the research that we are doing is in accordance with what's found overseas. So we have good confidence that what we bang on about 
is actually applicable here too. So we have a lot of research, a lot of collaborations going on um, just to see what's going on in New Zealand environment. Um, so we have these beetles in production at the moment, of which one, two, three, four, five. The so one at the end is the Mexican beetle, which isn't in production so much, but it is field harvested, so we can actually collect it from the fields because it's abundant in certain places, uh, particularly out in South Kaipara. Um, that big blue one is the spinacher. That's a, um, it's a large volume beetle which does love horse manure. In fact, most of these guys do love horse manure. In fact, it's almost a preference for it at a certain time of year. They really get into it. So we do have an array of beetles that do love horse manure. Um, this is a new one which has come into production, which will be um, in, hopefully online for sale this year. It's a prolific barrier of dung. It's um, a South African species. Um, this is a typical photograph in, um, in one of our rearing bins of manure being completely hammered by the beetle. And this is all the soil push-ups, kind of like what you see from an earthworm cast, but just on large scale. Uh, and they bury an awful lot of manure. And that's, um, that's come into production. And these are the ones that we've brought in this year. The top one is a winter specialist. Uh, when all the other beetles are largely underground sleeping through winter, this one's up doing its thing right in the winter active times for it, and it's the most abundance when everything else is quiet. Um, that one there we may well utilize in whole farm packages, which we'll show you, or maybe sell it as itself for specialist applications. And then this one here, which is this, probably the biggest beetle for the whole bunch of the 11 that we've got, which is still in quarantine as well. We have permission to release this one, so it's being disease tested as okay. And we're about to disease test this one. Um, and those will come into production hopefully um, next year or so. Um, but that will complete our array of beetles. And why have we got so many different types of beetles? Well, it's simply because manure is produced by these animals all the time. Um, and basically, we've got beetles that are active at night time, active at daytime, dawn and dusk flyers, things that are active in different times of the year. So to get complete control of your manure year round, you need a different array of beetles that are active at different types of years. So that you've always got one or two species present to try and control your manure all the year round, not just at one time of the year. Yeah, yeah, they do fight each other, absolutely. Um, the boys, see those horns? That's for fighting. Um, the girls for this species have a smaller horn. We don't know why she has one, but uh, the boys typically in most of these beetles use them for fighting to so get one girls. Eliminate the other? Hmm? One eliminate the other. You say that eat, did you say eat? Well, it, well that's, it's a good question, but what happens is that um, they utilize, they minimize their competitive pressure on each other by utilizing different times of the day. They also utilize different parts of the soil horizon. So some are shallow barriers and some are deep barriers. So they get around that problem of a limited resource and a limited space underneath it. That real estate underneath the cow pad or the horse pile is not particularly big. So they use different parts of the soil horizon to minimize the, the fighting. Part of the fighting is also what we want to um, get rid of the dung quickly as well because we want them to compete and get it in, get it down quickly and move off to the next horse pile. <coughs> um, drenches, we've talked about this, but I don't know how much we really need to um, worry massively about it. I just think um, you were saying a lot of the drenches that we use for horses are uh, may not be highly toxic drenches of those varieties. Mm -hmm. These guys? Yeah, these ones. So we have synthetic pyrethroids, but you may not be utilizing those sorts of drenches for, um, is it for external parasite control? I mean, for horse people, are they drenching for gut parasites, but also for lice and ticks and other things on the outside? Is that correct? Mostly internal. Well, it turns out that most of these internal drenches have either a limited impact on the beetles to no impact at all or no known effect on the beetles. The ones that are really nasty are these uh, ectocides or endectocides or some families of them which do external and internal control and they've got some very nasty chemicals in them and they have residuals in the manure for up to six months sometimes. 
the, the horse will be uh, releasing those active ingredients for a long period of time in the, in the dung. So, um, well, um, I, I don't on me myself, but uh, veterinarians would probably guide you as to what types of, of drenches are available. I think part of what the brief discussions that we were going to talk about uh, was simply um, how much drench you utilize or how often you use it. And more often than not, from what I understand, is almost too often that it's, it's relied on. And, um, and it turns out that there are a variety of drenches here that are actually dung beetle friendly and have been tested as dung beetle friendly. So, um, so those ones. So perhaps we can probably see that diagram. The green bits this one are here. the ones that are okay for dung beetles. Yeah. Um, so that's not suggesting. Yeah. So what are some... Or well, there's a, what, there's a range... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the right for adults. It has a... a yeah. Yeah, it has some impact on larvae. Adults know. Yeah, well, there's a cydectin. Have you heard of cydectin? Yeah, I don't know if there's a horse equivalent. Yeah. Ultramox. Oh. Okay, so, so there are some varieties out there that are known to be safe. And there are, of course, families that have within them certain drenches, so such as things like abamectins and ivermectins, they, they have a limited impact. No impact with the moxidectins. Ectocides, they're all fatally dodgy. And the white drenches are like um, candida or something, so it's like That's that one. So the anthelmintics, the, the helminths, which are the gut parasites, um, those are also friendly for horses too, uh, for, for dung beetles, sorry. I wouldn't say friendly for the horse, but for the, <laughs> um, but for the fauna that feed on the poos that contain this, the residual chemicals. Um, so there are varying effects. And I guess when you have dung beetles, the take home point is to be mindful of the types of drenches that have been utilized. I think in our discussions, we've found that probably the majority of drenches you do use in the horsing industry are limited to no real impact on the horses. Uh, sorry, on the dung beetles, goodness me. Um, it probably does have an impact on the horses if it's used regularly. And I'm hearing we just saw on a website before the talking about seven or eight week drench cycles in some instances, which is rather crazy, which is completely unnecessary. Well, you, typically you wouldn't harrow a, a paddock. Well, I would have thought so until the animals have moved off, of course, and then you've just got residual old cow pets, and, or horse pets, sorry, in this instance. Um, and those may well be utilised, or most of it being utilised by beetles if you had a flourishing population. And if it was an establishing population, they may well have been underground and done what they needed to and moved off to where the fresh manure is. Mm -hmm. At any of those instances, no. yeah, if it was fresh manure, it would cause yeah. major problems, but it never is. Mm -hmm. And the depth at which those blades go maybe cap 1% off those surface balls, but the deeper ones are not going to be affected. The, the larvae you merge up. Not so much. I don't think anything beneath the ground of any importance is going to get uh, negatively yeah. impacted by doing that sort of practice. The other thing I wanted to ask was about the um, water. Because mm. um, we were on the river planet this mm. year particularly, you know, it's been a terrible winter, mm. um, water temperatures are really cold. Yeah. So Well, no, some studies have shown that there is a repellency produced by not only the, the mother, but also the, the larva feeding inside the balls. The ball has a hydroscopic or water repellent nature to it. And I was also saying to a couple of other people here this um, before that they're also quite uh, adept at uh, gauging how moist the environment is and spread the balls out to allow maximum water movement through. And when it's drier, they pack them closer together to conserve the the moisture usage. Well, in the summer it's very dry. Yeah, so then the balls will be much closer together in those instances. But they've had millions of years of getting that kind of process right. So, um, yeah, th that sort of thing I wouldn't worry about. And, th and the other worst case scenario, if your paddocks are waterlogged for many months of the year, no. yeah, <laughs> but then um, you'll always have refugia on the margins and areas which don't have the water logging and they'll be successive recolonizations of those areas if it is just too bad. So, how um, do they hibernate over the winter? Well, so in northern climates, 
probably most of the North Island, to be honest. It's, it's not really bad. It's mild and warm. So when we talk about a, uh, a life cycle for a, for a particular beetle being from spring to autumn, it may well be for most of the occasions, but then there are some variations where you'll start seeing them having a longer um, period of activity than normal. It's because the climate or the conditions that we have them growing in are much more favorable. If you start going down to the bottom of the South Island, that's when you start seeing really defined times of activity because the climate really does become hostile. Um, but then again, several of our beetles, in fact, most of them come from those sorts of climates in Europe. Uh, they originated in places where they have snow and they're very cold winters and they have very dry summers. Mm -hmm. So um, those beetles are adapted to those kind of conditions. Um, so yeah, we've kind of got the right mix for what we think is the majority of the country where we've got the key issues with. Um, this is the costs. This is where people wonder, well, they're, they're expensive or they're not so expensive. The counter argument for cost on any of these sorts of things mainly is it's a one-off cost. It's also a cost where you're investing in something that is going to be self-sustainable from that point of establishment onwards. So while you don't have ongoing costs, this is a one-off cost where you don't need to be worrying about the process or adding more into the budget post-release because these are self-sustaining, minimal management solution to the problems. Yeah. Properties, you know, mm. prices, yeah. yeah. So the small block package, is that the one that you recommend for that? Yeah. I, I, we do recommend this for small blocks. That's why we've called it that. But mm. if it were me, mm. and, I, and I wasn't so worried about cost, because really the, the price between, sorry, oh, down here, mm. the price between this and this mm. isn't much. And when you look at the number of beetles that you're getting, the, 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 the point with this one, which um, from this one, is that you're getting way more beetles here. The more beetles you put into your small block, the greater the success of establishment and the quicker the uptake for the population numbers. This one here we put in here really because it's the bare bones minimum. It's more than the minimum required population size, but it's an absolute minimum. We, we, we chose not really to want to promote a great deal of the small package process because there's a number of risks evolved, involved with these things. You know, beetles have no respect for the boundaries. You have a small plot, your neighbor's got a thousand cows and all the beetles are just gonna bugger off over to his plot. You don't want that because you've just invested in $1,250 of beetles. So they don't have respect for boundaries. They only fly off because it's either reaching carrying capacity proportional to the amount of dung you have, which if there's one or two horses, there's not a lot of dung. Once you get a proportional number, it's like a predator-prey curve. The amount of the more dung you have, the more beetles you have. All the new recruits have to spread off to new pastures. But it was one of those things we were thinking it's a great idea, is that for small block owners that are in a neighborhood of other small block owners, the best idea is simply to form uh, a, a, um, a user group and you all chip in either a small amount to buy one of these packages and, and then you benefit from the spread of the beetles across all of your properties or like you say even better if you can afford $1,200 then you each buy one of the four most likely species suitable for your area and you all get the benefits of a multitude of beetles. I don't know how many of you are all best mates with your Neighbors, some instances maybe not, but it's probably the most advisable process really for sm small blocks because we kind of worry about selling you uh, a minimum number of beetles and then in a couple of years you say, well, they've gone. Well, there's, there's a lot of reasons why they might go if you've only got one or two animals. Mm -hmm. So we, we kind of are thinking at the moment of a set of criteria where we say, look, we're just not. If you've got only two animals or one animal and you've got only one paddock, we really don't want to be selling you beetles because it's, it's, it's not going to work for you. Do you come out to properties and do they um, eat sheep poo? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes to both. Yes to both. Yes. Um, sheep poo, absolutely. We, we also llama poos, pellets are good. Smaller beetles, of course, require or benefit from smaller poo. So about uh, the horses and sheep? Yeah, good. Excellent. 
Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't sell you a, um, uh, let's say if you just got sheep, I wouldn't sell you the big blue spinager or the big Spanish beetle because pellets aren't enough and they're dispersed to create sufficient volume to make one ball for a big beetle. A big beetle needs a, a big ball of poo. And pellets and sheep don't provide enough poo for big beetles. But the smaller beetles can get away with smaller volumes of dung. So we would give you smaller, medium-sized beetles, yeah. Uh, but you could have the big ones in the horse poo because there's an awful lot of horse shit. So uh, that's not a problem. What I worry about the most is the number of beetles that you should invest in. And, and if it was my money, I would put money on, on that one because you're getting way more beetles, which is what you need to get the, the numbers up the best. Yeah. That's a possibility. We've, we've looked at that risk, and the risk is minimal. And it's minimal because um, these beetles live in fresh shit, and they're not on the surface very often at all, except when they're dispersing to new fresh shit. Half of them are nocturnal, which is when these birds are asleep. Most of them, when they are active, are deep inside fresh manure or deep underground. Um, so opportunists such as birds, as magpies, um, poo kickers, turkeys, all those things are all opportunists, but none of them you'll find fossicking in fresh shit. You'll find them picking through dried old crusts looking for the invertebrates that are in crust that they can pick apart without getting their heads and beaks dirty. So any of the publications that we've seen overseas are opportunists such as ibis or magpies that pick through even foxes in old piles, which are long vacated by the dung beetles. Do you get um, quite often chickens going through fresh shit? Wow. It's also the being sent grain. Yeah. Because they're looking for bad chickens. Oh, sure thing. And yeah. Kids. Well, then, yeah, you may, that may be one of the potential risks if you've got an establishing population. But I think you'll but find most you of those beetles will be... The grain. <laughs> well, I think you'll find... <laughs> Not a problem. Well, I think most of those beetles will probably be yeah. in the tunnels and probably out of the way. You may get a small percentage. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that, there, there are always going to be risks attached to these things, especially when you're starting out with a brand new population of beetles. That's when you're most aware of the things. One of the other things I was going to point out, because we're at the end of this slide, is, uh, and I'll show you what these beetles should look like on this video footage. But um, I'll show you this now. Um, because this video will show you what you should be seeing in your, in your piles. It's quite awesome. But I think one of the things I wanted to um, mention is that if you've got a couple of few paddocks, like we were discussing earlier on, um, and you've got dung beetles being put in, you, you, it's not an end to you, a sudden end to you having to stop cleaning up your manure on a daily basis. You've got beetles there. One of the ways around having to get the numbers up is that you're going to continue having to manage the beetles, uh, the dung for a while. But one way is if you're going to shovel it like you do currently or poop or scoop it up, then deposit it on the side of one of your packet paddocks with a fenced off or a taped off line and you create a new pile at the start of each day at the end of the line. Don't create a mound because that's useless for the beetles, but you create a a line to add to each day with the manure, and that will be the resource or the reservoir for your beetles to go to if they're not utilise the manure that you're about to scoop up. So there's a way around it. You may well still have to do some managing until those populations get established. So um, it's just something to bear in mind. We're thinking, well, how do you how do you cope with beetles? Plus, you still got poo all over the place until the numbers get up. Well, that's probably the most obvious one. And the other one that you mentioned as well about um, drenching your horses. If there was a problem with the drench, then you could simply quarantine the horse that's being drenched or put it in some part of the paddock and collect its poo for the first 24 or 48 hours after drenching to make sure the beetles don't get exposed to that particular poo and dump that poo somewhere else, like in a compost heap. Be one way of not having to worry about it. Yeah, you tend to be, but the most lethal um, levels are within the first 24, 48 hours off the actual thing. At that point, then, most of the survivorships is becoming less lethal. Um, let me show you this, and then we'll cap it off. Oh. Um, this is some footage that we took in uh, an organic paddock in South Australia several years ago. And it just highlights 
a, um, the typical sort of carrying capacity you would expect to achieve in your piles, probably, probably from year five, six, seven onwards from when you were releasing beetles. Now this is that small black beetle that you've got, which has got a very fast turnaround a lot and several generations in the season. But the numbers are quite extraordinary. You would not see this all the time in all of your horse piles. You would see this when you've got brand new adults saturating the system that have just emerged out of the ground and they're mating and fattening up and getting ready. So there is there's a period of time where you're just not going to see anything and it's almost like a faith in the process allowing them to get on with it in the background before the numbers get to a point where you're actually going to see signs of, of dung beetle activity. And that may not be for a year to a couple of few years depending on the types of beetles you've got. But it's most likely that they're actually there if you've followed most of the mitigating processes and making the benefits of establishing the best for them, then they're most likely there in the background. I mean, remember, many of them are, are nocturnal as well. They're not doing anything during the day when you're walking around. So you may not even see them, and they may be just underground in their, in their nest underneath the tunnels. So um, it's, it's managing your expectations on, on how quickly you're going to see these things happening. But more often than not, they're, um, they're there. We, we tend to um, suggest to, to people receiving beetles to put them into one seeding paddock as close together as possible. The, the whole point is that they will dilute, they'll, they'll bugger off very quickly um, if you don't bury them into the cow pile, but invariably they'll disperse. We want to minimize the dispersing by simply putting them all in as close proximity to each other in the central part of your paddock. Um, to minimise them moving off and then you're just having to set your horses in there or if you've got some stock, have them set stocks. There's always fresh poo around immediately so there's no reason for them to disperse far and wide if there's plenty of fresh poo around for them to get into. It may be an inconvenience for your horses or yourself having a lot of fresh poo around but it, in the initial early days of establishment it's, it's always good practice to have plenty of fresh manure sitting around there with horses in paddock to Produce, keep producing fresh piles. Um, that'll minimise the loss. So, yeah, that this picture you're seeing now was was 24 hours later from one of the earlier shots. This is what's happened after a, a massive dung beetle event on the cow pats. It's a loose, dry chaff. That's the inevitable bits left over that's not being utilised by the beetles. It's broken up easily or wind blown off, enabling the grass to come through really easily. So it's a very fast process because all the other stuff's eaten or buried. It's interesting because we've had farmers ask, well, we're spraying when we've got big problems with black beetle uh, grass grub, uh, we're going to spray an insecticide on there. Well, it's not the end of the world for the dung beetles because the dung beetles are protected within uh, a, a manure pile, let's say, already a safe haven, and they're already deep underground, and the larvae are already protected in a protective ball of manure. So any infiltration off those uh, sprays are really getting into the surface where the free living larvae are off the grass grubs and so you may get some adults come into contact with that stuff but it's unlikely to really impinge on the effect your dung beetle. This is us just collecting um, dung plus beetles in South Australia. Anyway but that's that's basically the guts of the talk. Um, thanks very much for coming. If you've got any other questions give us a, let, us, let us know. But um, if you are interested in beetles, then um, one of the key things now would be to look at getting them sooner rather than later. And the key for that is that the earlier you put them into your paddocks, especially in the season, um, and if it is the smaller species that you take receipt of, the more generations you're going to have through in the actual season to get them established in your paddocks a lot quicker, rather than taking receipt of them at the end of the season where you'll only get one cycle through. So if you were interested in beetles, you want to be putting your name on the list sooner rather than later, because those that have their names on the list sooner will get beetles earlier in the season. Is there a waiting list? Yes, there's a waiting list. There'll, there'll always be a waiting list, and the more people that go on, the bottom ends are the last to be served, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The majority of beetles we've got now, we've got probably two-thirds of the year covered with the beetles we already do have. That one's a specialist really on great numbers in middle of winter time. He's the big blue one, the really big one which loves horse manure. It's about six months normally. And it's, it's nesting, it's actual nesting time. It comes up at Christmas time, but it's actually nesting in around April, May, June, July, August, around that time. Um, 
but the smaller one, about six to eight weeks typically. So it's very fast and you can get three or four or five generations through in the season with that one. You, you can't have a lot of big beetles in one pile of poo. The, the, more, the bigger the beetles, the less often, unless they're just feeding. But nesting, you could probably only get two or three pairs in, in one horse pile, really, for the amount of dung that they actually need. So then they'll, they'll compete, there'll be established pairs there, the others that arrive will get pushed off and go to the next pile. So, um, but the smaller beetles, you'll get 20, 30, 40 pairs of beetles in, in one pile, even more perhaps, uh, especially if it's a lot of poo, uh, because they're smaller and they don't need so much off that resource. Well, I mean, we have a small block package available for two, three or four animals. Those animals are always going to be pooing all day, every day. There's, there's, there's no real reason why they'd want to fly off to that dairy farm other than uh, supply of manure, uh, prevailing winds where the smells coming from someone else's farm and your poos are downwind and the beetles are upwind, the, the, where they go is upwind to where the next the smell is coming from. There's a number of reasons and the fewer stock you have on your farm, the greater the risks of the, the beetles going elsewhere. Yeah, well, no, we know that we can have spreading. Typically, when they spread, it spreads up to about a kilometre. But that's normally under two normal scenarios, and that's only when you've achieved carrying capacity on your farm and the new recruits, there's just not enough because of the competitive pressure for them, and they have to move. And it's normally then when you get about a kilometre of movement. But um, they have, on the bigger beetles, got radio trackers, micro GPS units. We do, we do mark and recapture, so we dye the beetles and we release them and we see how far they fly. Beetles that have just come out of the ground, they have no fat body and they've had no food. So these are on your property, they've come out of the ground in your dungs elsewhere. It turns out, and we didn't get a lot of reproducibility on it, but it turns out it seemed it was, I think it was less than a kilometre, it was several hundred metres was the furthest distance they could even possibly fly before they stopped because they've just got no energy. We tend to get the farmer to mark on the calendar the day of putting the beetles out, what type of beetle is and when you should expect to have your stock back and by the time the next bunch emerge. So it may be six weeks, it may be nine weeks, it may be six months. So you would probably get those beetles uh, any time from December all the way through um, into April. Small block owners may not have the sorts of money for four species. But so the idea of forming a consortium with your neighbours and each of you buying a small block package of each species is a really good option because they'll move around your, the four or five properties that you've had a, had a chat with. I, I tend to um, do deliveries in person for big orders and things in the Auckland region. Outside of Auckland, we have a two to three day rural delivery process, which we courier these things to the farmers. And when they get on the courier truck, I tend to phone up the farmer and say he's got two days to prepare to put set stock in his seating paddock. And when he gets them, he's just filling up several pats and that's it. So it's a very simple process. Um, but yeah, I, I tend not to go all over the country unless we've got big uh, workshops or um, uh, releases, you know, large, large scale releases and things like that.